All right, everyone, welcome to Making the Argument. I am your host, Nick Freitas, and today we have a guest that I'm pretty excited about because uh, Dr. John Arroyo uh, is a pretty impressive guy. Uh, but as we like to joke with each other, and we were joking right before the show, um, we, we knew each other back when, right? We, we knew each other back when, when, when both of us were in the military, um, desperately, Desperately just trying to make it through a special forces qualification course, trying to navigate um, all of the uncertainties, the confusion, the difficulties, the challenges associated with that particular mission, because that's where we met each other. That's where we met each other, trying to go through the special forces qualification course, get our Green Beret and get out to the units so we could go fight a war. And John did. John, John fought the war. He fought it in Afghanistan. He fought it in Iraq. And he fought it at a, in a way at home that... Nobody should have to, and um, and he overcame something pretty significant. And John has got a a story to tell, um, and it doesn't start with what happened on that day, but it is a part of it, and it's what has led him to the mission that he's doing today, and and why I'm uh, I continue to be very very proud to not only call him my comrade in arms uh, when we serve in the military together, but to also call him my friend. So, Doctor John, how you doing, man? I'm good, Nick. I'm good. Yeah, you're right. You're right about we were just trying to get through, you know, the qualification course. But I, I'll tell you back then, um, I know that your listeners, there's a lot of people that follow you today. And, you know, we've had some we, we had some great leaders that were with us in those formations and, and men that we look up to today, like Lloyd Went. And I remember Lloyd just saying, Nick is going to be somebody. Nick is going to Nick is going to do something that's going to be greater than the formations that that we're in today. And um, we knew I'm we just, all I'm knew just it glad, back then. I'm, dude, know. I'm just glad Lloyd didn't want to kick my butt. <laughs> <laughs> Lloyd was Lloyd you know, was a big but you know, dude. I'll, I'll man. say this, Nick. But even then, you know, you you had already been Ranger qualified. You came into the qualification course as an experienced, you know, I think a staff sergeant at the time. And I remember, you know, during small unit tactics. I remember looking up to you and, and John Fischetti and those, and those guys that showed up already Ranger qualified and, and weren't looking out for number one, but we're looking to bring a brother along with them. That's willing to be trained. And I remember we had different individuals from other MOSs, you know, that weren't infantry and I was one of them, but you guys grabbed onto those that were willing to learn and, and so I appreciate it. And, and I see what you're doing today because you're doing the same thing. You're still freeing the oppressed. The only difference is you just wear a different uniform. Well, I appreciate that, brother. Yeah, we, I mean, it, it, our good times, especially, especially phase two, special forces qualification course, like the small unit tactics phase. It's kind of like a mini ranger school and, and, and the SF course. And yeah, we, we had guys coming from all backgrounds and, and those of us that were coming from the infantry that had been to ranger school, you know, there, there was a lot of that training we, we did and we had some experience with. And then there was other guys coming from other MOSs where they didn't have the opportunity to go to ranger school. And, um, and John was one of those guys, but my gosh, you want to talk about a dude that I go back to this all the time when, when occasionally people ask me questions about what is it, what does it take to make it through, you know, ranger school or, or special forces qualification course or whatever it is. And, and one of the things I, I always say is, man, it, it's the guys that have made the decision that they're not going home without it, right? They're not going, they're not going home without it. And, and, I'm telling the audience right now, John was one of those guys, but, but he wasn't one of those guys in the sense that he was, you know, they're like, Oh man, I'm, I'm a, you know, whatever. I'm a tough guy. And I'm going to, John was the sort of guy that everybody just kind of, we, we all immediately liked John. John worked really hard. He always pulled more than his weight on everything that he did. And, and like he said, he was really eager to learn, right? This obviously when you're, when you're an SF, there's a lot of a type personalities. There can be a whole lot of ego and, uh, and, and, Again, John was one of those guys that he wanted to learn. He he wanted to be good at what he did, and uh, and and that's exactly what he did. And so, so tell tell us a little bit. I mean, we graduated the special forces qualification course, right? I went off to first special forces group. Where where'd you go off to? What what was that like after graduation? Yeah, I went off to third special forces group, and uh, right there on Fort Bragg. So for me, I grew up in the eighty second Airborne Division. I uh, got there in nineteen ninety eight. Then you know, you and I, two thousand three, two thousand four. You know, we're in the qualification course, but I signed into third special forces group one June 2004 after language school and uh, sat across from my sergeant major. And he said, John, you got 15 days to get your family in order and we'll see you in Afghanistan. I mean, it was that quick, Nick. And so um, but, you know, before we go into all that military talk, I really would like to uh, 
if it's okay with you, take your listeners on what actually got me into the military and why, why I, I found myself in that place. No, I, I think that, I think that's important. I mean, so yeah, let's, let's, let's start from the beginning. Tell tell us about where, tell us what it all starts, man. Yeah. Well, it, you know, it starts when I'm a young boy in Los Angeles. Uh, I grew up in the city of Whittier. I know that you're a California boy too, right? I think, I think you're Northern California. Yeah. Or you were, or you were, were. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you were. You're going to get me in trouble so, out here in Virginia, man. <laughs> like, keep that, keep that quiet. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, I grew up in Los Angeles. My dad dies when I'm like five years old. And, and I didn't realize, and, and I know that we're going to talk about this more uh, in the back part of, of this interview, but my dad dies when I'm like five years old. And I grew up, Nick, probably about the, you know, we grew up in the same era in the eighties. It was Tony Hawk skateboarding it and everything, everything was cool. But in the nineties, there was like a, like a culture shift. And it was almost like the atmosphere shifted when all of a sudden gangster rap, I, I grew up just miles away from Compton. Right. And, and all of a sudden it, it was just this ice cube and easy E and Dr. Dre and the chronic and, and that, that atmosphere shifted not only in our communities, but it shifted in my home. And it, and it, I believe that because there was, you know, when, when there's no train conductor, the train's going to go off the rails. And, and I had a good mother and a good grandmother and a good family and good women in my life, but my biological father wasn't there. And so my brother began to look, he began looking for a dad as I was looking for a dad. So I looked up to him and he got involved in gangs. And so I just, what do most people do? They follow those in front of them. I looked up to my bigger brother and he got into gangs. And so that's what I did. And, and really, as I look back now, Nick, it, it was really an orphan heart for us because I was looking for approval. I was looking for affirmation. Why? Because there's two things that happened. I never heard my dad say, I love you and I'm proud of you. And if and if you don't have that, if you don't have affirmation in your life from your father, you will go looking for it your entire life. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to add something right here. Not long ago, I spoke to a community of teenagers. And during that time, I'm, I'm, I speak to these teenagers. And that was Thursday. And on Sunday, this mom walks up to me and she says, Hey, John, thank you for speaking to the, to the teenagers. And she said, my daughter, who was standing right next to her, Nick, she says, my daughter was getting involved in sex trafficking. And I just about like, just about threw up in my mouth as I'm listening to this mom tell me that her daughter was involved in sex trafficking because this little girl with glasses on doesn't look like the, um, kind of the image in you know, your head on. Yeah. The, the image of that you would see like, uh, you know, in, you know, down in Colombia where they're being thrown in a van or something like that. you right. So. So I'm looking at this little girl when mom says that, and it's just almost instantly my heart connected with her. And I knew what this girl was going through. I understood why. And this is what mom said. She said she opened up a Venmo account and she began to sell pictures of herself. And mom said, when we found out what she was doing, she was one hour from being picked up. Well, what I was really trying to say is that she didn't look like the sound of freedom, that movie that came out, right? Where, where, you know, Jim Caviezel saving people and up the river of Columbia. It's the little girl next door. But what I felt in my heart is that that little girl had never heard her dad say, I love you and I'm proud of you. So what happened is the moment a man told her that she looked good, her little heart couldn't tell the difference between love and lust. And that's, that's what happens in my life. My friends, they saw the ice cubes and the easy E's and the Dr. Dre's and we were effing the police and it was all cool. So what did they thought that was cool? What did I need from them? I needed affirmation. I needed their approval. Today, I call it chasing likes. I needed them to give me their likes. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I went and I got jumped into a gang at seventh grade. By ninth grade, Nick, I'm a teenage father. And by 12th grade, I do methamphetamine for the first time. I know... I know I ended up in the special forces community. I don't know how because I joined the military, not because I was patriotic, but because I was a drug addict. Mm. And that was the way that I was going to get out of, get out of the situation I was in. Can you, but can I had, you, t- can you tell me a little bit about that? So, I mean, I mean, that's, that's a lot. I mean, you're jumped in at seventh grade. That's middle school. 
right? It's junior high. And, and then you're, you know, by ninth grade, a freshman in high school, you're, you're a father by, you know, 12th grade, you're, you're getting into drugs and whatnot. What, what was the catalyst? Um, because a lot of people don't, don't make that decision to where it's like, okay, I need to go into the military. I need to, I need to change my environment or, or whatever it is. What was the catalyst for you where all of a sudden you're going down this path because seventh grade to, to 12th grade, I mean, dude, you're, you've been in this what, this five years, right? This is five years doing this. Um, so what, what was the catalyst for saying, I, I got to do something different? Well, when you're involved in addictions, the world sees it. The only person that's deceived by the addiction is the people that are in the middle of it. Mm. Everybody sees it. It's just the people that are in the middle of it. And so my grandmother had a praying grandmother. I, have a, I often laugh, you know, when I'm out doing public speaking, I'll tell people, I had this four foot grandmother who prayed me, prayed for me. And that's honestly the truth, Nick. The, the catalyst to the transformation and what led me was a grandmother who didn't go off of what she saw. I'm the evidence of a praying grandmother, but also the evidence of someone that was willing to tell the truth to me and willing to give me tough love. And that person was my sister. So my grandmother was, was the one praying and my sister was the hands and feet to grandmother's prayers. So that's, you know, that's one of the things that, uh, that is the catalyst. And my sister came up to me one day and she said, Hey, look, we see right through the addictions. She's like, you're going to come and live with me because I'm going to make sure that you don't end up a loser and give your son exactly what you received, mm. right? You said it in, the, in this video that we were talking about before. You said it, there's something noble about the man who doesn't give his son what he received, but ultimately starts a legacy. And that's, that's what my sister not, noted in our lives that my dad died when we were young. And she, she stopped it so that plague wouldn't continue through my family. So she had me come live with her, sleeping on her couch. And if I, and if I slept past 8.30 in the morning, she began to waterboard me on her couch, brother. <laughs> I'm telling you, like, like if I slept in past 8.30, she began dousing me with water. And then I was like, look, what is it that you want me to do? She said, you know what? You need to join the military. Like, you need to change your environment and you need to get out of here. And I was like, man, the military is not for me. Couple more douses of water. I'm like, let's go see the recruiter. <laughs> so we end we end up in Pasadena talking to this army recruiter. Nick, this dude was a used car salesman, bro. Like <laughs> If you go to GoodRanchers.com and use promo code Nick, you're going to get 15% off. That's right. They've got the best American-raised beef, poultry, pork, and wild-caught seafood. Not to mention the fact that you're going to get 15% off all kinds of gifts that they have available. That's merch. That's boxes of meat. All of it. All the way up until December 31st. Because let's face it, some of you did not get presents in time. But Good Ranchers is there to make sure that you're squared away. So GoodRanchers.com, promo code Nick. 15% off gift boxes. There's, there's merch opportunities. There's all kinds of stuff. Go check out the website, get the discounts, hundred percent satisfaction guaranteed with GoodRanchers.com. I can say that because we were in the service. I mean, you know, but yeah. you know, he was good. He was a good guy, but I told him, Hey, look, I'm not here because I'm patriotic. I'm here because I need to, I need to change some things. And you know, I took the military as VAB, as we all did, and I scored a 29. Mm. I scored a 29 on a test. You needed a 30. I mean, that's – and here's why, Nick. Here's why I scored a 29 on that test. Because I was a people pleaser. When I was a class clown. Mm. I was in class trying to make everybody laugh while the teacher's giving the lesson. The teacher kicks me out because I'm a disruption – then he lets me back in after he gives a lesson. And I look over at my peers and I'm like, hey, how do you how do, you do that math problem? Mm -hmm. Why? I was too busy trying to seeking affirmation my entire life. And it all stemmed, Nick, because my dad wasn't in my life. And, and don't get me wrong. I had good men in my life. But there's something that happens when a father's not there. And, that's, and so that's what happened. Long story short, I end up in the military. I, I go back. I take the ASVAB. I score 31. <laughs> I score a 31. Two points higher, score 31. And I tell, the, I tell the recruiter, hey, look, I'm not interested in, in, you know, this being a career. So do you have truck driving? Like all the men in my life are truck drivers. I'm just going to, I just need a discipline and a skill. And I'm going to turn around, come right back home. 
And he was like, no, soldier, it's not truck driving. It's motor transport operator. Like, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. brother, whatever. <laughs> I ended up a truck driver in the 82nd Airborne Division, 1998, Nick, and that's where it all started. But, you know, I said this recently. The Army didn't make me a paratrooper. Obviously, they, they, they did, you know, by, by giving me the skills. They didn't make me a Green Beret. There's something that that is inside of you from the foundation of the world that only god put in there what i often tell people is the army again the army didn't make me a green beret what they did is they pulled the green beret out of me Mm. and you know this from our experience green berets can be made they they're identified and then they're molded and they're trained it doesn't matter how big you are how small you are how fast you can run no one no one can keep you going when you're cold, wet, hungry in the middle of nowhere with 100 pounds on your back. We've seen men that, were, that, that everybody expected would be that Green Beret, and they didn't make it yeah. for whatever reason. And so when I, joined, when I ended up in the 82nd Airborne Division is the first time that I had a man look at me and see what was inside of me and begin to call it out, mm-hmm. begin to call that greatness out in me that was all, always there, just never really developed. Yeah. No, it, that, that's true. It's, it, again, there's, there's this stereotypical image that people have in their, in their heads on, on what some of this stuff means. And, um, but, yeah, there, there, is, <laughs> there is a misconception I think a lot of people have that when you go into – you know, um, special forces qualification course or whatnot, that they want you there, um, that, that the instructors are there to, to help you make it. It's like, no, they're, they're there to, they obviously got to train you, right? Because you got to know what you have to do in order to be evaluated. But, and, and to varying degrees, some of those instructors did absolutely everything they could to try to get you to quit. And, and, and people have this idea, like the, are, are the instructor like, Oh, all right, man, come on, keep going, keep going. No, no, dude, you, you, you be on the side of the road and you're, you're, you're dead tired. You're done. You're hungry. You're everything you just mentioned. They don't pull up and say, keep going soldier. They pull up and say, dude, get in the truck, man. You want to, you want a cup of coffee? You want a donut? You don't got to do this. You don't got to prove anything. They'll try to entice you to quit because they're not looking for somebody that needs to be motivated. They're looking for somebody that has the capacity for discipline and, and is driven by something um, that says they're, they're not going to quit. So, I, I mean, again, you, you get, so you're, you're, you're in the 82nd and I actually, I actually got to the 82nd and 98 as well. Um, I got to the, I was second of three, two, five, um, got there in, in like October of 98, I think October, November of, of 98. Um, I went over to the 25th before I went to the Q course. What, what was the, what was the impetus for, for you to go from, you know, the, from, you know, uh, 88 Mike, you know, driving trucks and whatnot. I'm assuming you're an 88 Mike. Yeah. Yeah. So driving trucks and whatnot, do, doing the motor pool operations or, or uh, motor transportation operations. What, what was the motivation to go from, Hey, I want to do that to now, nah, now I want to do one of the hardest things <laughs> in the United States military. Um, an orphan heart. So what okay. happened is, so still and, and seeking I didn't realize that. this until, until recently, is again, that orphan heart just showed up in uniform and it, and it hides itself in esprit de corps, right? So here I am in the 82nd Airborne Division, Fort Bragg, North Carolina. I get there December 98, and there's no war going on. I think it was Kosovo. You may yeah. have been one on one of those, tri- those Kosovo trips, but that was the only thing going on. But if you're on, if you're on, Fort Liberty or Fort Bragg, whatever yeah. they call it today. You know, I just, it's hard for me to remember Liberty because I've known it for 15 years as Bragg. But, yeah. um, but when, what happened is my peers in the 82nd were like, oh my goodness, the Green Berets, the Rangers, they're the best. Well, takes me back to when I was a young seventh grade kid. What did I need? What did I need from people? Mm-hmm. I needed affirmation. So I started telling, uh, honestly, Nick, I had no intention on becoming a Green Beret. What I had intention on doing is telling people that I was going to go be a Green Beret. Got it. That was it. What I was looking for was their fanfare. Mm. I just needed people to be like, because when you're in a unit, especially a truck driving unit, transportation, and I start talking about how I'm going to be a high-speed Green Beret, 
everybody's like, oh, man, Arroyo, he's cool, man. Dude, did you hear Arroyo's going to selection? He's going to be a Green Beret. And I was just like, yeah, bring it. Give it to me. Yeah. Give it to me. Give me that pat on the back. Until one day, one of the guys had, uh, that was in my unit had been, through, been to selection and got selected, was going to go to the Delta course. And, um, and he walks up to me and he says, hey, man, either go to selection or shut your mouth. Hmm. And I was like, oh, shoot. Okay, so I put in my packet to go to selection. I had to put up or shut up at that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to do something. I put in my packet, and September 10th, 2001, I start selection. I'm in Camp McCall, September 10th, 2001. In September 11th, the colonel pulls us in the classroom, and he says, and this is day two of selection for me. Yeah. He says, men, we're now a nation at war. Nobody believed him. Yeah. Everybody was, we, we just assumed it was part of the scenario. Yeah. And, uh, but he wasn't lying. He said, if you want to be a part of what's going to happen in the next few years, you're in the right place at the right time. I made it, Nick, all the way to the end. 24 day non-select. I don't know how I made it past those gates that normally they kick people out if you don't make it through this gate, but I made it all the way to the end and I got boarded and the colonel pulls me in and he says, John, we we're concerned that you're not going to make it to the qualification course because of your academics. Mm. And he said, if you want to be a green beret, you're going to have, you're going to have to try out again. He's like, thanks for stopping by. And, and Nick, that's a, a lot of people don't know that, you know, I, I didn't graduate junior high. I was just passed along mm. because I was too busy being a people pleaser in high school. The teacher's assistant at in summer school after high school gave me the answers to this test, I needed to graduate one class. I mean, I failed or cheated, failed the ASVAB, made it by one point. I mean, I was just there by the skin of my teeth on most things academic. So when the colonel tells me, John, you're not smart enough, that's, a, that's the way, that's what I heard. When yeah. he said, you're not going to make it through our qualification course, what I heard is, John, you're not smart enough. Mm -hmm. And I walked away with, with, with that identity I guess, you know, well, one, I didn't have a dad. I never, I, I was never affirmed or approved. And then when you get told, hey, bro, you're just dumb. You're, you're not going to make anything of yourself. Well, it just goes in line back with what your life had been like, what you had been trying to get affirmation your whole life. And so now they're just affirming everything that you've thought of yourself already yeah. as you've been people pleasing. Well, and you've got to go back to your unit too. And you know, guys are going to talk smack. You know, they're going to give you, you know, um, they're going to give you a bad time. So, so what did, yeah. did, did you make up in your mind? I mean, as soon as he told you that, <clears throat> did you make up in your mind pretty quick, you were going to go back to selection or did it, did it take some mulling over? <laughs> no, I never thought I was going to go back to selection. I was like, I'm never going through that again. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, I'm never, I'm never yeah. going through that again. You're not going to get me. Yeah, to Cause do they, it they twice. made you do all the land nav and the trek, And then they're like, yeah, Every well, do it again. <laughs> Yeah. You know, wake, wake up at two in the morning and, and run until I tell you to stop, you yeah. know, log PT. I mean, you name it, you know, call the obstacle course, all, all that. I was like, I'm never doing that again. So what, what made but you change your I mind? then I got back to my unit. <clears throat> Say that again. What made you change your mind? I went back to my unit and they were getting ready to go to NTC, the national training center for rotation. And so I opened my mouth again and I was like, Hey, I'm going back to selection. I can't go with you to NTC. And they were like, well, if you go with us to NTC, we'll let you go back to selection. There again, I had to put up, you know, because yeah. I'd opened my mouth. And so I put my packet in again and I went back to selection. And I'll be honest with you, the first time I trained and trained and trained, but the second time I didn't, I was just like, I'm just going to do it. Uh, and the second time I got selected. But to, to really answer your question, I, I applied again because... I really wanted to make sure that my kids knew because by then I was, I was remarried. I had been, I married my son's mom and then that didn't work out, but I was already getting ready for, to, I was in another relationship and, and I had some stepkids and I didn't want my kids to know that I was a quitter. Mm. And so you said it again, previously, you said there's something noble about a man that starts a legacy for his family. And I wanted to make sure that my kids knew that dad wasn't a quitter. And so I went back and I don't know what I did different, Nick. I, I, I don't think I did anything different. I think I was more confident at land navigation, obviously. Yeah. Um, 
the first time I would walk five steps and check my map. And I think I ran out of time. You know, you can't yeah. do that. You can't yeah. do that. <laughs> yeah, they don't give you enough time to, to, to yeah, do a lot of so, dilly-dallying. <laughs> that's right. So uh. the second time I was a lot more confident in land nav. And I think that's what actually was probably got me over the hump. And so yeah. I ended up in third special forces group, three combat tours, two Afghanistan, one to Iraq as, as a weapon sergeant. And, and I want to say something because I think this is important for your listeners. You know, I show up in Afghanistan. That's where I meet my special forces detachment. One June, 2004, my first uh, base that I'm going to is, is Gardez. I get dropped off on this ring flight in the spe- in, in the ODA uh engineer the junior engineers right there and he's getting all the mail that's coming off the ring flight and so i meet my special forces detachment right there and i and i'll and this is what your your listeners need to hear the first time i ever had an anxiety attack in my life was in afghanistan but nick it wasn't because i was gonna face the taliban it was because i was gonna face my peers Mm. Every morning, as, a, as this former truck driver now became Green Beret, I was still green. You know, there's, you, you, you try to, uh, I guess, you, you tried to maintain or you tried to grab onto all the information that you can in the qualification course. But, man, you, things are moving so fast. It, it, you're getting information by fire hose, and you just hang on enough to get through that phase, and then you brain dump it, and then you go on to the next one. And so when I showed up on my special forces attachment, I was, I was still, I was still a rookie. I was still young. I still had, you know, I didn't have, I wasn't as grounded in the infantry tactics and things like that. And so when those meat eaters saw that there was blood in the water, the sharks came biting Yeah. and man, I remember 8am every morning I would have an anxiety attack before we had our team meeting. And then I ended up taking that stuff home, Nick. I, I ended up bringing that anxiousness and that anxiety and that fear, and I brought it home. But there's well, also something I also brought home. I brought home that alcoholism that dad used to do, right? That's my dad died of alcoholism. He, he actually, well, if I didn't say that, that's what he died of. He, he, he died of cirrhosis of the liver at 34 years old. Jeez. You know, as we talk about legacy again, People don't know that you're going to, you're going to impart unto your children something. Well, for me, I just did what dad did. Mm -hmm. I brought it in my home and I brought in all that anger and all the stress because I couldn't lash out on my teammates because they just kicked the crap out of me. Right. But I could, I could, I was the looter of my home. And so what did I do? If my family wasn't doing it right, if my kids weren't walking the straight line, if my wife didn't do what I wanted her to do, I just shoot her up. I didn't put my hands on my family, Nick, during that time, but I could cut them down with my tongue real good. Oh, and don't let me be drinking at the time when I'm doing it too, because I could really give her the business and give my children the business as well. During that time, as I'm deploying 2006, 2004, 2005, 2006, 2007, as we're going back and forth to Afghanistan and Iraq's now happening, my wife attempted suicide twice. Because I was a mean, angry, drunk. Um, but I'm here because I had a praying grandma on Nick. And that's, that's the bottom line. That's, that's the truth. That's, that's honestly the truth. Because my grandmother wasn't only praying for me. She was praying for my family. And God spared us. Uh, you know, it's not, I'm not proud. And my wife is not proud that she took that route. And, I, and I'll also say this. The only times my wife ever attempted suicide was under the influence of alcohol, which is something that we removed from our lives. We, you, well, we've been working through it. I, I don't, but my wife is still working through that, and she is, she is just about free of it. Were, were you overseas when she made the attempt, or were you back home? I was home. Yeah, yeah I was home. And it, and it was during the times when I'd come home and, and uh, just be mean and angry. You know, Then you're just getting ready for the next deployment. Mm-hmm. And here's something else I did. In 2006, I got into a motorcycle accident. They took me off my special. They took me off my detachment and they moved me into battalion for a year. Mm-hmm. And I took a second job. Uh, I went. And, I went to go buy a car, and the guy was like, "Man, you can haggle great, bro. You want a job?" And I'm like, "No, <laughs> I, I work for. I'm in the army." Yeah. But then I went home and I started considering what he was saying. I was like, "Oh man, well, I'm not deploying for a year. I'm not going anywhere. I could. Hey, we can use that extra money." And my wife is like, "Oh yeah, that'd be great." Let's go back to family. 
Yeah. I didn't have my dad. Yeah. And so my, so here I am now trying to raise a family and I got teenagers at home, but I'm going to work in the battalion. We just say nine to five. And then I go to my second job to nine o'clock at night so I can make a hundred dollars more a week. Who was raising my kids? Yeah. yeah. Because it wasn't me. The world, Nick. Mm-hmm. In Fayetteville, North Carolina. Yeah. The world was raising my kids and I got the world's results in my home. But here's what I did. I blamed my wife. Mm. And I blamed my kids for me being an absent father. So when you um I mean, obviously, it's I, I there there is there is this idea too. If if you haven't been taught otherwise, there's this idea that if you're if you're a Green Beret and you're going to combat, right, and you're providing, well, then you're doing your job. You're doing your job, and and really, again, what 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 is not understood sometimes is no, that's that's like half your job, and it's and it's and it's an important half, right, like being a man fighting for what you believe providing for your family those are important things not taking anything away from it but it's incomplete it's incomplete so at what point did you start to like what was the moment when you started looking at the situation look at the circumstances you said initially blamed your wife blamed your kids what was the point where you had to take like a hard look in the mirror. Like what, what was the point where, where you started to, you started to, to look at what you were doing in your life and, and wanted to make a change. Did that happen right away? Did it like, what happened? Yeah, I think, I think it actually happened about 2008 or 2009. Um, we were, we bought a home in this new community and, and for, you know, it, it was like block parties every weekend. I mean, it was, it was, everyone was just having these block parties and, I think God gave me a glimpse of my life. Like one weekend, I just had no desire to drink that weekend. And typically my wife and I were like the drunkest people at every party, every weekend. And, and it was just normal. Friday and Saturdays, we were going to have block party. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one day I didn't drink. And, it, and, it, and I feel like what God did is he said, let me show you what I see. L- I'm going to show you through my eyes what I see. And what he did is when I didn't drink, I got a glimpse of what my wife was doing and what she was like. And she was like falling all over. And, and it just almost disgusted me on how our life was. And that's really what opened my eyes. And then, and then what we do is, we, is like if we're not like for me, and I just speak on my own behalf. Uh, today I'm a man of faith and, and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And what happens is if we're not, if like for me, if I, I wasn't tapped into that community, I wasn't tapped in with Jesus. I wasn't tapped in with God. And so what do you do when you don't have that spiritual guidance? You white knuckle it. Mm-hmm. You white knuckle. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to drink this weekend. Uh, and and you, you hang on and you try to white knuckle it. So one weekend I said, well, from here on out, I'm, I'm not drinking. So that's after I watched my wife fall over one weekend, all falling all over the floor. Maybe two weeks later, I'm like, oh, I'm done drinking. And my friend's like, oh, man, just, just have a little sip of this. Well, here I am. I'm white knuckling it, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm trying to do it out of my own strength. Nick, this flesh right here, you don't have the ability to control it without the spirit. Mm-hmm. You don't. The Bible says that, that, fle- that your spirit and your flesh are with war with one another. Mm-hmm. And so what happened is, here I am at a party and in the same environment with all the same people trying to be different. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I'm sitting there and I'm, and this guy's like, here, drink some of this moonshine. I made it with cinnamon, bro. You know, just take a little sip. And I, and I wake up the next morning with phone calls saying, Hey man, do you remember what you did last night? Mm-hmm. That was the catalyst to change. And we hit rock bottom. Here's what happened. I was told that that night that I was going to, that I wasn't going to drink that I hit on every wife at the party. Mm. My wife was at the same party, but she was just as drunk as I was. So there's no way for her to be able to take care of me or protect me from myself. So we walked into a church in 2009 there in Fayetteville, North Carolina. And that's, that's where it started. That's where the change started. And you know, I walked into this church 
and they were, I'd been there before. And I remember, you know, this guy walks up to you and he's like, hey, brother, come to our men's group. And I'm like, I'm not going to your men's group. I already know I'm not going to your men's group. And so I just kind of take his card. And before I even, you know, before I even get home, it's thrown under the seat. But this day in 2009, when I walked in the door, I knew I was going to, I knew that I was going to, that I was there to stay. That's probably the best way to say it. And that's where things change. And, And I'll be honest with you, Nick, we drug, we drug the old life with us as God began to to transplant us in like a tree. This is the best way I can explain it. We were like a tree that was uprooted and then replanted because what happens when, because a lot of the things that we were doing and the lifestyles we were in, we were these roots like a tree. They go deep. Some of them were relationships of of our friends, of our peers, green berets. that were not good. They were not healthy for my family. Yeah. So when I'm getting transplanted, God began to cut away all those roots, all those belief systems, all the alcoholism, all the addictions, everything that was in my life. And, and, and it didn't feel good either. Some of those relationships I had for years. Yeah. You know? Um, and that's when, things, that's when things began to change. So, so things... Uh, and, and, I was going to say, so things, things start to, things are starting to change, right? You're, you're starting, you're starting to get plugged in. You're starting to make, and, and again, you guys are starting to make kind of more fundamental changes, right? Like you said, it's not just the white knuckling. It's not just a saying, I'm going to, I'm going to like power through this. You're now starting to make the sort of adjustments and changes of environment, of belief systems, of worldview um, that, that are going to allow you to, to actually transplant, you know, what you had been doing with what you wanted to do for you, for your family. Um, and, and at some point, like you actually, you actually left SF. Like you made a pretty, pretty significant career change. Yeah. Like what, what was the uh, catalyst with that? Was that, was that part of this? Was it different? What, what was, what, why? Well, I hit 10 years in the military and I started thinking about how I was going to feed my family after. And, and I was looking around. There was a lot of people that were starting to do con- get out, do contracting. Everyone was like, oh, man, I'm going to go to Iraq and go be a contractor, and I'm going to make this big money. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. Mm-hmm. And, I, and again, I, I, I thought back to the guy that didn't have the education, yeah. and I was like, I don't see myself building a range and being a Green Beret and training people and, and <laughs> you know, all, the, all that other stuff. And so I started to consider – how am I going to feed my family beyond the uniform? Because Nick, I I was an average green beret, man. I'll be honest with you. And it seemed like the more I realize this now, I can look back. The more I tried to put badges and tabs on my shoulder, the more I failed because I, I, I believe that God didn't cause me to fail, but he used it because what I was trying to do is I was trying to put a badge on my chest that would say, man, if I'm a jump master, if I'm a ranger, then, then I've, I've made it. Then, man, I finally became the man that I said I was going to be. But that, never can, that can never replace the emptiness in your heart. So what I was doing is I was trying to, as a Green Beret, fill my chest up with all these accolades and, and build my, my portfolio so that, I mean, you know, so that I could feel the emptiness in my heart, but it was going nowhere. Yeah. And, and I wasn't, I wasn't achieving everything. So I began to start looking at what was like beyond the military. And I started talking to the warrant officers and the officers. And I said, Hey, look, you know, talk to me about education. Talk to me about, you know, do you have a certification that says you're certified in this and you get paid at that? And, and just all these questions about how I was going to feed my family later. And I applied to this active duty green to gold program. Nick, I'm the dude that failed almost everything or had to recycle, <laughs> had to do it over. I'm serious. I'm, I'm, I was the strong ranger, bro. You know what I mean? I was the guy that I, so, so I let me, let me, the let me, let me share, let me share with the audience that reference real quick. So we used to have it. We used to have a joke in the military. You can be a strong ranger or you can be a smart ranger. <laughs> <laughs> and strong rangers usually you know, had to recycle, had to do a lot of push-ups, had a lot to do a lot of extracurricular activities um, in, in order to get with the program. But yeah, so when he says I was a strong ranger, that's I want everyone to understand what that reference is. 
<laughs> and so, you know, and, and let me clarify, I never became Ranger qualified, but I just use that as a reference point yeah. as, as I was the knuckle drag. I was the guy that I used my strength or, you know, even in, when we were in small unit tactics, I remember saying, Hey, let me carry that rucksack. It's the heavy one because I wanted to prove that I was, th- that, that I wanted to be there to yeah. all the other guys. But anyways, so when I apply to this active duty green to gold program, I never thought I'd get accepted. Th- never, but I do. And I can look back now, Nick, I can look back now and I can see grandma's prayers. I can see God's hand on my life now. The college I end up getting accepted to is a Baptist college, but I wasn't there for a, for a theological degree. But when you end up at a Baptist the- school, even though you're there for a, an arts degree, you still got to take religion courses. So I can see little by little along the way where God was beginning to call me. He was beginning to mold me. And it all started in 2009. And here's what I think your listeners need to hear as well. My grandmother, she died in 2007. She never once got to see me ever speak on stage. She never got to see the transformation in my life. But it's not because she was faithful. It's because God is faithful. And she didn't go off of what she saw. And I said it earlier. She just, she prayed me through. And I believe her prayers were as active today as they were when she prayed for that young gang member boy uh, that didn't have a father. And so I believe God honored her, God honored her and all that. So anyways, I, I ended up applying, getting accepted and I go to college. And when I graduate college at this Baptist college, I graduate with a 3.9 GPA ranked number 80 in the nation among 4,000 ROTC cadets. That's the first time, Nick, that I've ever crossed an academic stage. And I'm talking about, I mean, I know we crossed the stage to get our, you know, diplomas as Green Berets, but that wasn't really like an academic, you know, that was almost like an achievement, like an award at the end, you know. But the first time I ever crossed an academic stage is when, is when, I lined up, I believe, with what God wanted me to do. And it wasn't me trying to achieve and put another badge on my chest. It's when I lined up with his calling for my life. So you, you get up, you, you graduate college, you get commissioned, and you go into the medical corps. I do, yeah, yeah. Um, I, and I chose medical because, you know, I had some former team leaders that were like, go infantry. And I'm like, no, (laughs) no, (laughs) no. You know, they were like, you should, you you need to be an infantry officer. I'm like, I'm 36. I'm not 20 years old. Like you were, you know, I got T for trained. I got that t-shirt brother. Like I'm good. So medicals everywhere, Nick, you know, and I was in the medical, like the medical administration side. And so I'm like, Hey, I'm not going to be a PA or doctor, but Hey, if I ever need to feed my family, no matter where I am in the world, I can work somewhere in the medical community. Yeah. Yeah. So where, where do you get, that that was my thought process. Yeah, no, no. I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, you're like a lot of, a lot of guys, a lot of guys wish they thought more about what was going to happen once they, once they got out of the service. I mean, you did something, you picked a career field that, you know, it's marketable. You're going to be able to do stuff. So walk us through, you know, what happens next? Yeah, so um, I speak to my my branch manager, and um, you know, well, really, my assignments manager. We all have assignments managers, and and where we're going, and it was a lot easier back then to be able to call them up and and try to work deals. And so I said, look, man, I've been on Fort Bragg my entire career since '98. I know what's going to happen. You're going to send me right back to the 82nd Airborne Division because I'm Airborne qualified and Green Beret. And you're going to send, I'm going to show up in the, you know, first three, two, five, and this young Lieutenant Ranger, this, you know, young captain's going to be like, let's see if we can shoot better than the green beret. Let's see if we can run faster, you know? And so I'm like, yeah. let's see, like, I don't need my career at 15, 16 years in the army to be a selection event every day. <laughs> I was like, I was yeah. like, let's go, some, let's go somewhere else. Yeah. So I just, anyways, I ended up at Fort Hood today. It's called Fort Cavazos. I get there about November of 2013. And, um, and it's good. I'm this new platoon leader. Everything's great. I'm excited to be there, but then something happens about five months later, Nick, that I think it's, it's important for your listeners to hear. So we'll fast forward five months. I'm now this platoon leader. Things are going good. It's a Wednesday. It's April 2nd of 2014. And 
I'm in this, I'm in this course where the instructor tells us, he says, Hey, look, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to your unit and get your, your property book put on a CD. So, you know, pretty much get all of your equipment put on a CD because the class that I was in was like the unit movement officer course. So what we're going to do is you're going to be the, you're going to be the individual that if your unit has to deploy, you're going to partner with the air force and you're going to get all your equipment to where it needs to go. Yeah. That's essentially what I was doing. So I show, I, I'm assigned to first medical brigade. And so I, I go to my units four o'clock in the afternoon. I'm, I'm getting out of my car and I'm trying to get to the, to the battalion headquarters before everyone's gone for the day so I can get this information that I need. And as soon as I step out of my car in the parking lot, I hear, I instantly hear shots fired and I'm like, hold on. That's, we're not in Iraq or Afghanistan anymore, but you know, no one ever thinks that they're in danger on base, Nick. I mean, I honestly, I thought what I heard was funeral detail. Yeah. That's what I thought I was hearing. Funeral detail, you know, funeral detail practice. Yeah. It, you know, sometimes you hear blanks going off as the soldiers who are assigned get that assignment, you know, they're practicing, but something wouldn't let me move to just like shrug it off. I just stayed put and I was like, man, those rounds just sounded so real. But where I was, where I heard the shots fired were to my one o'clock and I'm looking to my one o'clock and, and so your listeners understand to my nine o'clock was first medical brigade headquarters to my 11 and 12 o'clock were all the soldier unit buildings. And then to my one o'clock was this road that divided first medical brigade from a transportation unit. So as I'm looking to my one o'clock, a car comes from the road that I'm looking at, pulls up in front of me. I see the car, I see the individual, I acknowledge it, but I turn my head back to where I heard the shots fired and the next shot I heard ripped through my throat. And I'm, and I'll move this real quick. But on April 2nd of 2014, what I was actually hearing is one soldier that was on a shooting spree and he was shooting at everybody he saw. So as he was driving down this road and the soldiers were standing behind their buildings, he was shooting at them, pulls in my parking lot. I looked to my right and the, he puts a 45 straight through my throat, severs my jugular vein, goes through my voice box and travels into my right shoulder. You know, Nick, we're a bunch of, we're Green Berets. Mm -hmm. And we know what, what bullets do to people. And we know that if, that we're trained to put bullets in certain areas, it's going to stop people. So for someone to take a 45 point blank through their jugular vein, they, they essentially go straight across their neck and all the way to their right shoulder. That's that's a kill shot, brother. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, we, yeah. we know that. that. That's a kill shot. People don't live through that. Yeah. And so when, he, so when I'm shot, he turns, drives off, and I turn away from him. So he goes off to my left, goes to, towards my 11, 12 o'clock, and I move away from him back towards my 5 o'clock, and I just try to get away from him, try to get back towards my car just looking for safety, and I fall flat on my face, and my life is pouring out. And, you know, I share this story often. Nick, it should have took me seconds to bleed out and die right yeah. there on the ground with a 45 that just severed my jugular vein, went through my voice box, my neck, my throat. As I'm laying on the ground, here's what I didn't think about, Nick. Do you remember all the stuff that I was talking about before, all the accolades, all the badges, all the tabs, you know, all the likes? all the achievements that I was hoping to get, all the stuff that, that life tells us, if you have this, then you have it all. If you have this and you made it, if you have this and you achieved, if you have this title, then John, you made it because that's what the world had told me. And that's what I went after all because, all because I didn't have identity in myself. And so here I am, my life is pouring out on the ground and everything that I tried to be, everything I tried to achieve in that moment not one time did I think about it. The only thing I thought about when I thought I had seconds to live were the people that I sacrificed most. My children and my wife. And you know, Nick, back in those days, my wife never once asked me to do any of those things. My children never asked me for any of those things. All they ever asked me for was me but I couldn't give it to him. 
So my life is pouring out. I assume I have seconds to live and I start praying and I say, God, is this where it ends? And I hear this audible voice. It didn't come from outside. It came from inside and there was no one around me. And I hear this, John, get up or your wife is going to die. And I just shrug it off because I don't, un- I, I don't understand at that moment what's, what I'm experiencing. And I hear it again, John, get up or your wife is going to die. Nick, six months before I was shot, when I finished the officer basic course in San Antonio, that day that I finished the course, June, or I'm sorry, September, September 20th, my mother-in-law died that day unexpectedly of an aneurysm. Nine days later, my father-in-law died of cancer. So I lost my mother-in-law and my father-in-law nine days apart, only six months before I was shot. Two years before that, we lost my brother-in-law in in a hunting accident where my father-in-law loaded his gun that they were going to go hunting. He sets it down. Everybody's getting their gear together. And my father-in-law's gun goes off and it hits my brother-in-law in the hip. And he essentially, he dies. He, he dies in my father-in-law's arms. So we lost my brother-in-law, my mother-in-law, my father-in-law. And we had been on Bragg for 15 years. Now we're at Fort Hood for five months. So all of our infrastructure, all of our family, everything is at Bragg. Here we are in Fort Hood. And I believe now that God spoke to me audibly. And he said, John, get up or your wife is going to take her life. And this time she's not going to make a mistake. Nick, this is... What I'm going to say next is is super important for your listeners. God didn't shoot me to give me a testimony so that I can go tell the world about him. But he also didn't stop it. And people say, hold on. There's so many things, bad things are happening. Why didn't God stop it? Because we live in a fallen world. Nick, you're a politician. You see it. I, I, we all listen to you. We all follow you. And you say, it, man, there's some evil stuff in this world and people have to, they have to take note of it. Well, we've, we live in a fallen world and we, the Bible says that it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. God didn't stop me from being shot. But what he did is he stepped into the middle of it and he gave me an opportunity and he said, John, get up. And I had a choice, Nick, just like everyone else. I had a choice whether to believe him or stay on the ground and die. And the truth is it was easier that day to stay on the ground and die. Most people would have said, Oh, angel, John, before he hit the ground, honey, he was already gone, but I would have knew. So God didn't stop me from being shot, but what he did is he stepped into the middle of it and he told me to get up because your family is worth it. And as I laid on the ground, just like going back to selection the second time, my family was worth it because what would have been my legacy? We, I've said this multiple times. You've said this. There's something notable about a man that's not is going to ensure that he leaves a legacy for his family, even though he didn't have one. What was going to be my legacy if I chose to stay on the ground and not trust the voice that spoke to me to tell me to get up or to even try? It's like going to selection a second time. Why did I go back? Because I didn't want my kids to know that I was a quitter. So here I am on the ground and my life is pouring out. What am I going to do? I had to try. Whether I was going to live or not, I had to try. And I get up and I just start walking and I grab onto my throat. And I'm walking, I see a soldier walking towards me from a distance, and I'm trying to get to this soldier. And, and Nick, four o'clock on Fort Hood, there should, it should be a sea of soldiers, mm-hmm. but there's only one walking towards me. And, he's, and I'm trying to get to him, and I, I assume as soon as I get to him, he's going to help me. He gets 10 feet in front of me, and it's a soldier that shot me. We meet face to face, only 10 feet apart. And the only thing I can say, Nick, The only way I can explain it is there was divine intervention. He looks at me, looks to the left and right like I wasn't even there. And he turns, walks into the brigade that we're both standing in front of. He shoots three more people, walks out the back and kills himself. That day he shot 19 of us. 
before, before, before you say something, I want to add this real quick. So I shoot off to the right and I try to get away from him. And some soldiers, they're standing behind the windows because they now people are starting to be alerted that things are happening. And so one of the soldiers that, that ran to me to save me, he later told me this. He said that, that they're all standing in, in this, this building and they're watching and the, all of a sudden they see me coming across in front of them and they said this is what alerted them to me. They said it looked like I had a red scarf flapping in the wind but it was the blood squirting out of my neck and one of the soldiers yells out, dang, that dude is bleeding. But that guy that yelled that Nick didn't run to save me. He didn't even run to help me. A good majority of them stayed behind the wall, stayed behind the glass in protection. And I think, Nick, as a nation, everything that you've been talking about, everything that I'm saying, is that there's some people bleeding. And we've been the ones, like the Joshua's and the Caleb's, that have been called out, that are willing to run and willing to speak up for the fatherless, and for those that are not willing to speak up and have a voice, because we weren't only called to free the oppressed in uniform, we were called to free the oppressed before the foundation of the world. Because Luke 4.18 says this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to free the oppressed. So, my gosh. <laughs> So you're you're going you're going through this. The guy finally he shoots himself. So the the threat's been neutralized. Um, but yeah, like you said, you you took you took a forty five ACP to the jug. <laughs> like that's that's not a. Um, so so what happens next with respect to, you know. Medical personnel showing up on site, getting you to the hospital. I mean that that had to be. That had to be an incredibly tough recovery. I mean, you're sitting here talking to us, and this dude shot out your voice box. So, I'm guessing there was some steps in between now and then. So, what 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 happens next? What happens next? Yeah. So, uh, there are some soldiers that ran to me. They get to me. They throw me in the back of a truck. You know, I have, you know, for those that would remember that, I say they dukes a hazard me. To the, you know, they dukes a hazard <laughs> me to the yeah. to the hospital. Um, but they get me there to the hospital there on Fort Hood, Darnell Army Hospital, and and there's a doc that intubates me, and and he does it, and it's a, another divine intervention because if he didn't, my neck was swelling so much it would have closed off my airway. Mm. They get me to the elevators to get me in to get me into surgery right away. I was the most one of the most critical. So I get to the elevator. The elevator doors open. They go to push me into the elevator, Nick. And two doctors come running out because it's a mass casualty situation. Again, there's yeah. 19 of a shot plus the shooter. He killed himself. So there's nine, there's 20 people injured, some dead. And, and he goes to, so these two docs come out of the, come out of the elevator and they're running towards the ER. And before they pass me on the gurney, they find out what's going on with me. And they were the ear, nose, and throat surgeons. Oh so as they're God. getting ready to put me in the elevator, the doctors that I needed were exactly where I needed to be. And I often tell people this. The moment I obeyed the voice, everything I needed was exactly where it needed to be. Mm. So they, they alert my wife. She identifies me. Um, you know, everybody didn't think that I was going to make it through the night. I did. Ta-da. <laughs> um, and then my recovery, they moved me to San Antonio, Texas, and I began to recover there. I spent four years in, um, uh, in some pretty serious recovery. I was in the hospital for a month. I would say a month. I wasn't able to speak. I had a trach in my neck for six months. Um, or may, no, maybe, maybe about three months. I had a trach in my neck. They, they weren't sure if I'd ever get my voice back, but just along the way, just miraculous things. God just began to do things in my life and heal me physically. Um, he began to heal me emotionally as well. You know, I was shot on base by a broken soldier. Well, when the military put me back, put me in recovery, they put me on base in a, and then they put me in the, at, during that time, the wounded warrior battalion and in a formation of broken soldiers. And so, you know, I was, I was faced with, um, with my fears right away. There's something that I think that your listeners need to hear 
30 days after I was shot, when I left the hospital, when I left Fort Hood, or when I left San Antonio and, and being an inpatient, first thing I did is I went back to Fort Hood and I, and I went back to the location I was shot. And I believe that that was a divine point in my life because, Nick, these days people don't want to face their fear and their pain. What they want to do is they want to take a pill or they want to take a treatment and people tell them, hey, you don't, you don't need to feel anymore. Don't worry about that intrusive thought. Just, just do this, just do this treatment and, and you don't have to feel. And we're just, we're going to block out, we're going to block out any, any intrusive thoughts. I get it. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the medication is bad. Believe me, I take in medication and I'll take it again if I need it. But I went back to Fort Hood and I didn't know why I was doing it. But now I look back and I understand why. I went back to face my fear and my pain and I stood on the very place I was shot and I claimed victory over it. And there's a picture that I have. It's in one of my books, but also I share it often. And it's me with my hand in the air with a trach in my neck and, and my, arm, my other arms in a sling. And if I didn't go back there and face that fear and that pain, I don't believe I would ever been able to move forward. Because what happens is if you don't deal with the root of, of where your pain initiated, then you will chase symptoms your entire life. You will, you will then take a pill or need a treatment if you don't deal with the root. Going back to Fort Hood for me was the root. And I understand that not everybody gets the opportunity to go back to the place they were wounded. But they, also, they have counselors, they have pastors, and they can at least talk about it and, and go to those places. And so, you know, medicine's not bad, but if you're taking it for 30 years, it's because you didn't deal with the root. You just, you just manage symptoms your entire life. So let me, let me ask you about that. I mean, obviously your family had been through a, a whole lot because you had talked about, you had talked about how you behaved toward your family when you were still in SF and in between combat tours, you had the motorcycle accident, right? The, the, the block parties, all this other stuff. And, and it, I mean, as you're telling the story, it feels like things are starting to come together, right? You're, you're, you're changing environments. Um, but then, you know, your, your brother-in-law dies. So your, your wife's brother dies tragically. Your wife's mom dies yeah. tragically. Your wife's dad dies tragically. And now she's showing up at the hospital to identify you. Like what, what did, I mean, obviously, obviously this is, this is horrible for your family is they're wondering, they're worried about you. They're wondering about the future, everything, but you know, you wake up the next morning and you're going through recovery, but what was, what was that like for you, for your wife, for your, your kids in the hospital and going through that recovery time? Like what, what walk us through that a little bit. Yeah. What people don't know. And I didn't know either is that my wife went into shock that night because just six months before she was in the hospital with all the bells and whistles and, and all the buzzer sound from her parents. Mm -hmm. And so when my family was trying to get information from my wife, she was shut off. She, she, was, she was in shock. <clears throat> so I, I leave the hospital, and they put me in a Fisher House hotel room with my son, Mason. He's my stepson. He, he comes and takes care of me. So initially, everybody, the family comes together. It's like, it's like immediate healing, right? Yeah, hey, yeah. Dad lived. We're going to make it. But how, how old is Fisher at this point? Yeah, so Mason at that Mason, point is, is like about 20, probably, uh, he's about, yeah, he's probably about 20 years old, some, okay. somewhere around 20 years yeah, old yeah. or something like that. And, um, and so he comes, because what happened is Fort Hood and, and, and Fort Sam are two hours from each other in Texas. Um, one's in San Antonio, that's where I was recovering now, but... I was stationed at Fort Hood, which is in Colleen, Texas, which is two hours. And so my wife, we had four dogs and two birds and, yeah, yeah. and, and a life going on. And so yeah. who's going to stop life? You know, how do you, yeah, how do dogs you still need navigate to get fed, that? Man. They don't, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, life is happening. That's what a lot of people don't understand. When soldiers get injured, life's still happening. Things yeah. happen, you know, people come in immediately to that acute situation, but eventually, you know, that goes off and people got to go back to their lives. And so, my son Mason came to live, come, come take care of me in this Fisher house. Um, and during that time, I remember I, I just, Nick, I did what every good soldier does. I just moved to the next objective. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't slow down for self care. I didn't slow down to, to take an inventory of my wounds and what my wife was going through. 
All I was thinking about is, how am I going to stay in the military? They're going to kick me out. I just got wounded. They're putting me in this wounded warrior battalion. They called it a transition battalion. I wasn't transitioning anywhere. When they told me I was going in the transition battalion, I'm like, what are you talking about? I just became an officer so I can get to my 20 years to give my, my family a better life. Now you're telling me I'm transitioning? There's no way. So what did I do mentally? This hadn't caught up with this. And so what I did is I went to every company commander in that transition battalion and I began to ask them for a job. I be, and so what I was doing, Nick, is I had this wounded spouse. You know, we, we've done care under fire, right? We've done care under fire training. How are you going to maneuver if one of, your, one of your teammates is injured? How are you going to recover them? And how are you going to, um, you know, isolate the enemy? I mean, all, the, all those care under fire training tactics. Here's what I was doing. I was doing care under fire, but I wasn't doing it with another, with a teammate. I was dragging a wounded spouse and her wounds weren't external. They were internal. She was emotionally bleeding out because of she, I didn't slow down long enough to, to triage my wife and get her help. And I wasn't doing self care on myself and allowing the healing process to happen. Till one day, one of, my, one of my case managers sits me down and she says, John, you need to slow down and it's okay to heal. And Nick, it was almost like in that moment, like my grandmother was in front of me and I finally listened and my soldiers, my shoulders just sank <sighs> and, I, and I walked through the process of healing. And if God knew what I was going through, spoke to me and told me to get up. He was also going to ensure that he took care of me. But I, again, I was white knuckling it. I was trying to do it in my own strength. I was trying to do it. I was trying to make it happen. If I was going to stay in the military is because of me. I wasn't even living because of me. Mm -hmm. So I'm here thinking that I'm going to, everything's going to happen because I'm going to do it. That's what I was trying to do. And I finally slowed down to walk through the healing process. And that's, that's where it all changed for me, Nick. So what, what, what does that mean? What does it mean that, that it all changed? What changed? Well, the, I went back to that route. So what did I do? What changed for me? When I went back and faced my fear and my pain, when I slowed down long enough to allow myself to heal, to identify what, uh, to identify the pain and emotional, physical pain, and to realize that I was injured and that I may very well not be able to stay in the military and, and was finally able to process those realities of my situation and not just think, well, I'm just going to, I'm going to make it happen. And then, uh, there's some, there's some steps that I took. One, I avoided isolation because isolation is a death sentence. I avoided alcohol. Why? Because I don't drink anymore, Nick, because I liked it. And I knew that in that moment, if I was to drink alcohol, that I would just go back to being the person that I was. And then during that time, I was under medication. You know, I was under some pretty strong medications. And Nick, I, I believe today that there's so many people, our peers, and, and you hear it, you know, 22 a day. I believe that there's so many veterans Active and non-active, because what people don't talk about is the, act, the active duty statistics of the guys that are killing themselves right now. Mm -hmm. But I believe that there's people that never intended to kill themselves, but they got drunk one day. Mm -hmm. And so that hedge of protection wasn't there. They, they, they were in their right mind to protect themselves. And so the steps and the things that changed is when I slowed down to, heal, to allow myself to heal. I, I walked through those steps that I was just talking to you about, but also I forgave, I forgave the man that shot me and I forgave myself for hurting others. Nick, that was so important. And then I let people help me. That is hard for us as green Bridge. We don't let people help us. We got this, right? That's what I did when I walked out of the hospital. I got this. The other thing is I began to tell my counselors the truth and I began, uh, I began to give them answers to questions that they weren't asking. Okay, so when I walk into account, when I went in, because when you're shot in a mass shooting or just even your listeners, when you go through anything, there's a 
probably a list and, and the counselor's like, okay, well, they're, they got this trauma, so I'm going to go down this and I'm going to ask them these questions. But here's what they didn't know. They didn't know that my wife had lost her, both her parents. They didn't know she lost her brother. She, they didn't know that we had just moved from Fort Bragg to Fort Hood and we had nobody. They didn't know that I lost my dad when I was a young kid. They didn't know that I almost failed almost everything. So here's what happens when you don't, when, when, when you take things in, in your life and you don't deal with them and you stick them in the closet or, or in, in our environment, you stick them in a rucksack and you, you, you swear you're never going to think about those things again. When you get broken the way Angel and I were broken, everything that you never dealt with comes out. And your counselors think that they're dealing with this, what's on the surface, but they're not. They're yeah. dealing with everything you never dealt with. And so when I begin to tell my counselors the truth about all the stuff, when I forgave, when I avoided alcohol, avoided isolation, and all those steps, that's when, some, that's when it changed. And when I was willing to face my fear and my pain, that's when I was able to heal. So Not did, just manage symptoms, but to heal. What did that mean for your relationship with, with Angel, you know, with your wife and, and with your kids? It, it meant a lot. It, it, and it meant like it was in the Fisher house with my son Mason that I looked up to him and I got tubes coming out of almost every orifice of my body. And, and in that moment, Nick, I mean, he could have did anything he wanted to me. He could have said, I remember you but he didn't it was in that moment that i was broken that i looked up to my family to my wife and i began to i began to tell them that i was sorry for everything that i did and it was there i want to say that i believe that god put mason and i in this fisher house hotel room because god said john you're utterly broken i mean you're you've been broken in every way a man can be broken so I'm going to just start fixing everything and I'm going to start with your family. And so there was a lot of, I'm sorry, will you forgive me that needed to happen? And it was in my brokenness that my humility came forth because it's green berets, man. I mean, it's, <laughs> we talking about yeah. who says they're sorry. Yeah. Yeah. So, Obviously, you get to a point you had a you you had a a plan for the second half of your career, um, and this is just a I mean this is a huge departure from it, um, but you know God uses that to bring healing with you and your family, um, with your wife. At, at what point? At what point? Because I, I you know it was it was <laughs> it was that long ago. It was, I think it was gosh it was actually probably about it was over a year now. I think. Um, Man, the dates are all mixed in together. But I, I remember one of the guys from my church saying, "Hey, we, we've got we've got a men's retreat coming up. We've got some other things coming up. Do you know anybody that you think would be a good speaker?" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, I do." <laughs> and uh, I said, "Y'all, y'all need to reach out to John Arroyo." Um, and he goes, "Oh, what's the story?" And I told him, and his like jaw dropped. I said, "Yeah, yeah." And um, and like I had, I mean, that was the, that was the first time we had actually been in the same room together since special forces qualification, it's like special forces graduation. Um, cause yeah. we were, we were on groups on the other side of the country, right? We had different theaters yeah. of operation. Um, and, and you know, our, our tours didn't sync up or anything like that. And so I remember, I remember when everything happened and hearing like, Hey, did you hear what happened to John? I was like, no, you're kidding me. And then every once in a while I'd kept, I'd catch like clips of stuff that you were doing and stuff that we were speaking at or whatnot. And I remember watching, I was like, man, yeah, this guy, you know, it'd be great to have John out here. And, and it was wonderful to be able to catch up with you, to be able to meet Angel. But the, the thing that really just, I'll tell you, the thing that just impacted me is because, again, the last time I had met you, you know, going through the qualification course, good guy, but if you would have told me, John's going to be up on stage talking about how God saved him, his family, and how he sees it as his personal, how he sees it as a responsibility and a mission to be the sort of man that God has called him to be for his wife, for his family, and for for all the other young men out there that, like you said, it it, it is it is wonderful to be able to protect, preserve, and, and pass along a legacy that was handed to you 
what do you, but what do you say to the guys that they don't, they don't have that? And we tell them is, is, well, then it's yours to build. And, and I'm watching as, as my buddy, John Arroyo, right. Who, I, who I'm thinking, yeah, yeah, cool guy. Good green beret. Right. But I'm watching you get up there speaking with just absolute power and conviction about this. And not just that, but the, the thing that, the thing that impressed me the most, man, and this goes back to that whole idea of humility was the absolute owning and taking responsibility for things that you had done and the way it had impacted your family and saying, no, I did that. There's no, there's no getting around it. There's no sugarcoating. There's, I did that. Um, and in some ways, you know, God used this to bring me face to face with it so that that, so that I could be the husband, the father, the man of God that he needed me to be. And, and I, I, and, what was the point where you started to see, where you and Angel started to see that, oh, this is the, this is the next chapter of our life, and, and <laughs> we didn't plan this. This ain't us, but this is the next chapter. When, when, did that, when did that moment start? Yeah. You know, when I got – before I was shot, I never saw myself public speaking uh, or doing anything in ministry or with ministry. I, I just saw myself as going to church on Sundays and Wednesdays because we had walked into church in 2009 and, and our lives changed. But after I got up off the ground, there's my want to change, Nick, the inside of me, something shifted inside of me. And I thought I was going to go work fortune 500, go make money, take my, you know, take my skills as a green beret and partner them with my education. Now being a former officer and I was going to go tackle, tackle the world and, and go make the money and go live the life that every Green Beret talks about. You know, I'm going to go contract and make that big money. And I, that's what I assume. But as, during the recovery process, it was clear. I remember one day I was at a church and I had this, like, this question in my heart that wouldn't go away. And this is when I began to realize that God is, still talks to people. Not only the day I was shot, but so I'm at this church and I, and I have this question in my heart. And, and, and the question is this, John, what are you doing? And so I stop and, and I address the question. And, and it, this was over like a week period. I, I began to, you know, pray and talk to God about it. And it was this, John, what are you doing? And I said, God, I'm going to church. You saved me. And, and I thank you. So I'm going to do what every good Christian does. They go to church. Mm -hmm. And he said, John, I didn't save you to go to church. I saved you to tell the world about me. Now get up and go do it. And I was like, how? That's when things began to change. And I began to talk to my wife about what I was feeling and the desires inside of me to, that were changing. And, and it, it wasn't all like all of a sudden, like, oh, we just had this <laughs> moment, you know, where yeah. God just came down and we just both agreed. She was like, what? What? <laughs> Ministry? What? Like, yeah public speaking what you're not expecting me to speak are you like i'm not a public speaker like and it it wasn't something that all of a sudden we just had this divine moment and and I, i'll be honest with you nick are my stepkids right now and and even my son in california john jr they know god but they're not at a level that angel and i are at they're still walking out their healing they're still walking out their sobriety um I mean, there was a lot i mean there's a lot of stuff that happened in their lives and that they had to walk through. They, they had trauma in their life. I'm getting ready to, I'm not, not switching gears, but I want to share this. And I didn't realize this. I was talking with a woman just recently and she was telling me that they found out that children of veterans that, that were deployed from 2003 to 2013, that a lot of the children can't hold jobs. Mm -hmm. Um, that there's a lot of trauma. So there's a lot of secondary PTSD and trauma that came in the homes and it's affected the children. Well, guess what? Right here, right here, right here. Mm -hmm. When that lady was talking, she was explaining my family. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening now is we're having to go back and to love our family right where they're at, right in their situation, the same way grandma loved me. Um, so there wasn't one thing that just switched the light bulb, but my want to change. And as I began to talk to my wife about what I was feeling, God began to start speaking to her as well. Mm -hmm. And that's the process that started. And, and, and it happened through our healing process. And again, we were hardcore drinkers back in the day. When I got up off the ground, the desire to drink alcohol left me. 
like divinely left me. Never, alcohol has not touched these lips since the weekend before I was shot. Mm. But my wife has had to walk out her sobriety. She, it, it, it's been different, but yet God called us. Mm. So what, what is that? I mean, again, I, it, it, was, it was great having you come out here, come out to, to Culpeper, Virginia, to be able to share with the men's group and then coming in on, on Sunday and sharing with the whole congregation. I mean, tell us a little bit because there, there's there's two things. One, obviously, you've you've worked with some various ministries. You're 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 working on some other projects right now. Um, but the other thing I, I wanted I wanted to get to um, is you you really you really have keyed in because um, it obviously you're sharing the story of 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 what happened with with your experience of of growing out with growing up without a dad, trying to find trying to find that affirmation, trying to find. And really specifically affirmation from other men, right? From, from other men that you respected to basically validate that, yeah, you're, you're a man too. You're a tough guy too. You're a good guy, like all that stuff. And then there's this and the, and that, that, you know, that encounter with, with God through everything that you guys had to deal with both as an individual and as a family. But I, I remember when we were talking before the show, you're like, Nick, one of the things I really want to talk about on this is is this brokenness that's going on within young men right now. Um, and you are, you are, I mean, you're way down that path. You experience this. You're, you're not, you're not talking about something you had to go off to school and study. You're talking about something that you lived through. Um, tell us, tell us about that, that chapter next. And, and like this kind of this step within the ministry that you guys are involved in. Yeah, I, um, a couple of years ago, when I, you know, I retired in 2018 and went straight into working with a, with a minister. Maybe a lot of your listeners may know him. His name is Dave Reaver. He's a Vietnam vet, was disfigured, throwing a phosphorus grenade. And, and so we stepped into full-time ministry in October of 2018 doing that. Um, and then I would say probably about 2020, I began praying, right? Here I am in ministry and I had got up off the ground in 2014. So God began developing me. And then in 2018, I'm on a staff on ministry, but in 2020, I prayed and I just said, God, you know, is there anything in my heart that needs healing? You know, that, you know, David prayed in some, I think it's Psalm 139. And he says, Lord, search my heart and see if there's any anxious thing in it. And, and if there's anything wicked and show me, I didn't think that God was going to actually like give me an x-ray vision of my heart. And, you know, but when you start asking for things, he's going to do it. Uh, and, and so, and I thought it was going to be like, Oh, well, you know, John, you need to work on your pride, you know, just make sure that you keep your pride in check. Cause you could, you could easily, you know, make it about yourself. Cause you're, you were a green beret tip of the spear, but he begins to show me the things that are in my heart. There were wounds that needed to be dealt with. And one of them was, I never heard my dad say, and the second thing is, one day I was battling some um, some stomach issues, and I had some friends pray for me, and I said, "Well, what you know what what what's going on with my what's going on with my uh, stomach?" And my friend said, "My friend said, John, I don't I don't believe that it's your stomach. It's it's like I think it's I think it's something more spiritual." And I'm like, "Okay, so it's the when they prayed for me, that physical issue just went away. It was gone." But there was something more there, and it was it was fear. It, it was fear that I was dealing with. I was dealing with anxiety. Well, here I am in full time ministry. What minister deals with anxiety? What minister deals with with things from the past? Well, that was me. And I, I went and I sat with a counselor, and uh, more of like a spiritual counselor, uh, a Christian counselor, and and we walked through this counseling process, and. What happened is when I began to ask God what was going on in my heart, he showed me that I had never heard my dad say, I love you and I'm proud of you. And if, and if you think about this, Nick, Jesus, Jesus in, in Luke chapter three is, is, is baptized by John the Baptist. He comes up out of the water. And right then in, in that scripture, the Bible says that God affirms him. He says, he says, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. At that point in Jesus' ministry, he didn't have to do anything. Or he hadn't done anything. He hadn't raised anybody from the dead. He hadn't done a miracle. And his daddy was already proud of him. Jesus never had to earn his father's love. All he ever had to do was receive it. So 
That's one thing. I went out looking for a dad all my life when I always had a father. That's one of our missions. The second thing is that I was talking about this fear. How is it that, how is it that I'm a minister and I'm battling with fear and anxiety? So when I begin sitting with this counselor and, and we ask God where, where this fear, where the root of this fear came from, he, I see this image as I'm praying, and it's of an apartment building that we lived in when I was in sixth grade. Well, what happened in that apartment building? My, we used to have a cousin that used to come over, and whenever my mom walked out of the room, he would try to touch me. So what happened is I had this root of fear that, what, that I struggled with, almost like a spiritual battle like, that, that caused the anxiety in my life or this fear that was in my life, and it stemmed all the way back from when I was a kid. So one of the things that we're doing now is that we are helping people understand that they don't have to earn God's love. And, they may, and some of them don't even know him, right? So what we've done, we wrote a book called I Never Heard My Dad Say, and we're helping people meet their father for the first time. Jesus showed up on the scene, and he started saying, my father, our father, your father. Back then, they didn't know him like that. And there's been so many people that they didn't grow up in church like me. They didn't grow up in church, and so they don't know God. Or, or, or the, the God that they do know is the God that's getting ready to crush them for sins, God getting ready to smash them. But they don't know him as father, and they don't have to earn his love all they ever have to do is receive it. And so our job right now is to introduce men and women, young and old, to their father. And Nick, I thought, I thought that, that the fatherless generation was yours and I generation, or your, your generation, my generation, and the generation behind us. That's not true, man. The, as soon as we wrote this book, we began to have 70-year-olds come up to us, weeping men, telling us, how they heard, they never heard their dad say, uh, just testimony after testimony of this thing. This is a fatherless society. And I often tell people, and I know you speak about this, the people that are burning cities down, you want to know who they are? They're the fatherless generation. That's them. And so our, I believe that my job is to do what I did in uniform only without the uniform, is to continue to free the oppressed. And how am I doing that? By introducing a fatherless society to their father. No, that's, that's incredible, John. I mean, I, look, I really appreciate the, the willingness to, to share the story, to share all the story, you know, to, because um, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that is missing in so many people that offer advice is, is a sense of authenticity with respect to the mistakes we make as, as men, as husbands, as fathers, as sons, um, and, and the process and the idea. Again, I, I've always, <laughs> I, I don't even know how quite, quite to word this, but I, I, was, I was trying to explain to somebody a while back when I was talking about Christianity, it was the whole idea of, you're never going to find a worldview that does a better job of explaining the human condition. I said, there, there's other, there's other worldviews that attempt it, and some of them make a pretty good attempt. I don't know. I don't think they're true. I think this is true, but, um, but the, the thing that, the thing that is, the thing that really moves is the, is the redemptive quality of it, the redemption and the reconciliation that, that takes place first between you and God. And then that allows it to take place with the other people that you care about in your life. And, um, again, your, your willingness to go out there, to be honest, to be able to share the story. I know it's, you know, and, and again, it's this whole idea too, where I think sometimes we have this ridiculous notion that, well, I'll do it once I've, I'll do it once I've reconciled everything. Once I once, again, once I've figured it all out and once I feel comfortable that I'm worthy enough to go out and do that, it's like, dude, that ain't, <laughs> you're never going to hit that. If, if you're, if you're waiting to be perfect before you do it, um, there, there was only one guy that ever accomplished that, and that was Christ. <laughs> um, and, and he, again, we get out there and do it because we're commanded to be obedient. Um, so I want to thank you for that. But I also want people to, where can people, where can people find out more about uh, you? Where can people potentially reach out uh, to have you come and speak? And, and where, can they, where can they find out more about the, the book you've written and, and the importance of some of the work you're doing around that as well? Yeah, everything, uh, everything you just asked about, they could just go to getupwithjohn.com, and it's a one-stop shop. 
and all of our links to media, social media, what we're doing. Um, something that we're doing, you know, two initiatives that we're doing right now is we're going, we're going into public schools. Uh, we're going, we're trying to get into public schools and, um, in the military, the military keeps calling Nick. They just keep calling. And, um, you know, I honestly thought that I was going to be one of those ministers that, that travels all over internationally, like doing the revivals, but God keeps sending me back into the troops. Mm -hmm. And, um, I believe I know why mm -hmm. it's because you and I smell like the sheep. So no, I, I, I will, I get will up tell with you. Yeah. Get up with John got uh, get up with John.com. We'll, we'll definitely put that in the, in the links of the show. And, and again, I just want to really reiterate brother. It's, it's once again, it's, it's always an honor to, uh, to have you as a, as a colleague within the military, but it's, it's a greater honor to have you as a friend. And so thank you very much to you. Thank you to angel. Thank you to your kids. Um, and again, we, we look forward to keeping in touch brother. So thank you very much for being here today. Thanks. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for watching. Um, please go up and go up and check that out. Check out that page again. We're going to put the link in the description. Um, again, if, if you're someone that this is, this is maybe a book you need to read. Uh, there's some more discussions. There's things you can find online where, where John has talked about his story and talked about other details we weren't able to get to today. Um, check that out. Check that out because I can tell you right now from, from seeing the guy speak in person, um, it, it, I mean, I'm, I'm not, I'm not saying I got all teary eyed and weepy, but I think the dude next to me might've been, might've been cutting onions. I don't know, whatever it was. Um, it, it, it has an impact. And, uh, and for all you guys out there too, where you feel like, Hey, maybe, you know, maybe that's not your story. Uh, maybe you did have a good dad. Maybe you are working to be a good father. I, I will tell you right now, there are always, there are always aspects, um, where, where we can improve, where we can be, where we can again, continue to either protect that legacy that we were handed to improve and pass along. Or if we're building one from scratch, um, what John has to say is impactful and it's going to make a difference. So once again, thank you very much for joining us and we'll see you next episode.